Hey, congratulations, congratulations to all of the Jamaican athletes who are participating at the World Athletics Championships in Oregon, Oregon 22. And those who have participated thus far, congratulations. Wow, <laughs> what a field, what a field. Special congratulations to young Oblique Seville. Did you catch him? Did you see him? Continue to show good form, man. And we're seeing him with great composure. Sub 10. Mm. Oblique Seville, doing pretty well, doing pretty well. Congratulations, my young brother. He placed fourth yesterday in the, ten, in the 100 meters uh, final. It's a clean sweep by the USA. One man in form. In form. <laughs> Fred Curley. Did you see him? <laughs> so one, two, three, USA. And young oblique Seville at uh, coming in fourth. But wow. Wow. He's a future. Oblique Seville. He's a future. 644. Sleeping nations either die or they wake up as slaves. <laughs> in the words of Ataturk. Ataturk Pasha. Mm-hmm. Sleeping nations either die or wake up as slaves. Lots happening and we want to get through. I want to maybe just raise some issues because we won't be able to discuss all of them. Just a few talking points. Did you notice that Joe Biden was touring the so-called Middle East and that he went to Saudi Arabia? You saw that fist bump uh-huh. between Biden and the um, MBS? The Prince, you saw that fist bump. Wow, it's a fist bump that is still resounding around the world because Biden said that he was gonna make Saudi Arabia pariah. He was just joking, though. We all knew that he was just joking, <laughs> it was a joke. So, what are we looking at? Because Saudi Arabia is still responsible for and propped up by the United States in a lot of ways um, the violence, the war, the killing, the murder, the genocide that is happening in Yemen. So there's a proxy war that's happening in Yemen. The U.S. is fighting Iran. Or let's just say the West, but mainly the U.S. is fighting Iran in, in, in Yemen. But how are they doing that? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the one that's fighting in the name of the United States. And so that the worst genocide, war, tyranny that's happening now on the face of the earth, or one of the worst, because we've got this... this Genocide that's happening in the DRC, ongoing genocide. And then you've got Yemen. And we talk about Yemen a lot in this space because it is the war that is, on, that is not covered. There, there are no cameras there. There are no refugees to show or put up in the palace, in Buckingham Palace. There are no... CNN or BBC or De Chavela or any of those global um, channels there. And so you don't know that the worst war, that there is a genocide underway in Yemen. And it's a proxy war between Iran and the United States. You don't know that. But I want you to take out your maps and we do, every time we talk about um, Yemen, I ask you to look at the globe, look at the map of the world, Google it or look at it if you have your atlas or you have a, one of those little round globes in your house. Um, look at Yemen, find Yemen, find where it is. And understand that this is a bigger war than just a proxy war between these two nations. Yemen is also strategic 
in terms of the control of ports. You know, there's another country that we don't hear a lot about at all. It's an African country, an African nation, Djibouti. Look at Djibouti in relation to Yemen. Now, every single major power, every single one, I can't, I, I don't think there's any that's not there. They've got a base in Djibouti. Djibouti <laughs> belongs, I, I, I don't know why, when, when I think of these things, I, I usually, the first thing that comes to mind, and maybe because it is the most, well, it, it, yeah, because it is, it, it, there's vulgarity, you know, it, it's a vulgar situation, and that's why you think that, you think prostitution, um, because this is what is happening in Djibouti, right? So, so look at Djibouti in relation to Yemen, look at Yemen in, in relation to um, the ports and the waterways, Mother Samad, our blessed ancestor, has always said that the war in the end will not necessarily be about oil, but it will be about water. Now it's oil and water. The told them can't mix, you know. <laughs> okay. But truth is going to rise to the top like oil. It is an untenable situation. That's what it is. And so that I, I, I'm not quite sure how much more can happen in Yemen before it all blows apart. With Yemen right now, though, we hear uh, Biden saying that it's on the agenda, right? So when he spoke to MBS and those in, uh, Saudi Arabians, they talked about Yemen and he's insisting that the war in Yemen must stop. This is interesting because it is the United States that is arming Saudi Arabia to bomb and to kill in Yemen. And they've always armed Saudi Arabia. The United States kicked up its relationship and its friendship with Saudi Arabia under the Bushes, Father Bush and Son Bush, right? They kicked it up. They've always had this relationship, but they really took it a, a, a few decibels up under these two. And they were in and out of each other's houses. Remember that? We talked about that back in the day. And then we saw the relationship between jo uh, Donald Trump and the Saudis that he raised it even and a few other notches i mean many many more decibels and um the and so that he it was under trump that we saw this massive spending on weapons being given to saudi arabia to bomb yemen we saw donald trump's son-in-law going into saudi arabia and becoming very good friends with MBS, do not ignore that. The Saudis and the Saudi royal family, the Saudi royal family, very, very close to the American presidents and their children. Now, when, when Biden was running, he knows, he knew then that this was not necessarily something that was going to wash with a lot of free thinking and freedom thinking um, Democrats. So he said that he was going to make Saudi Arabia a pariah because of um, Khashoggi. K right. The journalist Khashoggi. Uh, and so when that came up, that's what he said. But here is what happened in Saudi Arabia yesterday and the day before yesterday. So Donald Trump went in. He came out and he said that he had a conversation with MBS about because remember everybody knows that Saudi Arabia under the directive of this of the crown prince ordered the murder of the American journalist Khashoggi okay Th that's that's well known that's not that's not a secret that is well known as a matter of fact the it's the American intelligence that that is saying this so that Joe Biden would, of course, believe in his own intelligence, wouldn't he? 
So he believed that and he said in when he was in the debates leading up to the elections that he was going to make Saudi Arabia pariah. But NATO <laughs> NATO teased and provoked Russia into an escalation of an ongoing war, ongoing conflict between Ukraine and Russia. And I say, I choose my word carefully. I'm very, very careful in this, in what I say here. And as a result of that, there's a problem with the supply chain and with oil and, and so on. And because now there are sanctions on Russia, so you can't get Russian oil. So where are you going to get oil from? So you're looking now to uh, oil, other oil producers that you said you never did have, no, no, you didn't want to have any kind of relationships with. So now you are thinking about Venezuela. You have already gone to Venezuela. Now you're going to Saudi Arabia. So here's the thing. Now you want oil, and that's why you're going to Saudi Arabia to change all of that. So Joe Biden comes back, and he says, but you can't just walk into Saudi Arabia like that because the American, well, part of America is going to be asking, what about Jamal Khashoggi? What about this journalist, this American journalist who was killed? What about him? What about human rights? And you say that you are the defender of human rights. By the way, today is World International Day for Justice, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, so you, you, you're going to have to show at least in speech, if not in action, that you're concerned about human rights and uh, you can't just walk into Saudi Arabia and have this arrangement with them without talking about human rights. Now, the Jamaican government and the Saudi uh, relationship is a whole other thing. That is, the Andrew Holness-led administration right now has become a lackey of the United States. So whatever the U.S. does, watch Dominican Republic and see what Jamaica does because Andrew is patterning everything um, that he does right now of what's happening in the Dominican Republic. But that's another story. I know that there are just so many elements to this story and so many places that you can branch off in that you, probably, you can hardly finish your sentence. But here we go. Uh, so he said, Joe Biden comes back and he says, well, he was asked by a journalist, what about Khashoggi? Did you talk to MBS about Khashoggi? He says, yes, I did. And I told him that he was, resp- that, that, that I believe he was responsible for Khashoggi and that uh, long and short of it, something had to be done on, to that effect. And that Khashoggi said that, um, MBS said that, no, I was, I'm not responsible. And that, and Biden says, but no, I pushed back at that. And I said, no, you are responsible. Well, lo and behold, today, <laughs> today we're hearing from a Saudi diplomat who says, listen, I, he didn't say anything like that. It's long and short of it, he says, no, Joe Biden didn't say anything like that. I didn't hear him say anything like that. And Joe Biden was asked again, you know, so a Saudi diplomat who was there said, you didn't say anything like that. Was he, was he telling the truth? And Joe Biden said, no, he was lying. So here we are. He said, he said, and nobody's a wiser, but here comes the oil. Hey, I uh, are the owner for the oil. <laughs> Morning, my brother, that's hot. <laughs> So, so we're watching that. We're still watching that. Uh, let's see where the oil goes. Then another thing Joe Biden said going in was that uh, the war in Yemen must end. And uh, of course, Joe Biden is the one that's arming Saudi Arabia to bomb Yemen. But then he's saying the war must end. Granted, there's kind of a uh, an uneasy um, truce in Yemen since April. Uh, but nothing to write home about because it's, uh, it has happened before. Uh, internationally, still, we are seeing also that there is a visit to the DRC by the, Belgian, the, Bel- uh, the Belgians. And I'm going to look at that shortly and tell you about it later on in the 9 o'clock hour because that is very worrying. I don't know where they're going. But here we are. They're there. There's also a heat wave in Europe. I understand that people are falling down, literally. Um... We did talk about a solar flare, and we we have been saying that in the space. And my brother uh, Kwame Pianki has been very, very 
um, strident in that to say that we're not paying attention to solar flares in the way that we should. But maybe it's about time that we begin to do that. We're seeing some serious heat also here in Jamaica. So for those of you in Europe, in the UK, wow, I see where it's really, really, really serious in the UK. Um, Take it easy. Be careful now. In South Africa, we see some ongoing protests against Cyril Ramaphosa. Interesting. I know I made some bold statements here and I got some serious backlash when I said that Cyril Ramaphosa was leading one of the most corrupt governments that we've ever seen in the African National Congress. That Cyril Ramaphosa was dangerous for Africa. You know, it's about time that we begin to recognize where there are so-called African leaders in black skin who are even more dangerous than the enslavers. Cyril Ramaphosa finds himself in that situation. Now there are protests. The uh, protesters and the ANC is seeing a, a fissure, a crack, in the ANC because the protesters are demanding the removal of Cyril Ramaphosa as president and they're saying it is because of a number of personal scandals including the alleged theft of what they said uh, uh, an alleged four million dollars hidden they say at his um, Fala Fala farm Um, there's a lot to that about 300 protesters mostly African National Congress members ANC members marched through Johannesburg, South Africa's economic hub, to deliver a list of demands and call for a new president of the ruling party's headquarters on Friday. Some of the arguments in support of removing President Cyril Ramaphosa mentioned the rising cost of living, fuel price hikes, incessant power cuts, and rampant corruption in state institutions. Uh, We're watching that very, very closely. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Much more to say, but I'll have more to say throughout the program about that and more issues. I want to go now to the phone lines to speak with my very first guest this morning, Dr. Uh, Chikia Thomas, co-chair of the Global African Congress. And that is re- the International Conference on Reparations, August 4 to 6, and the Global African Congress, International Congress of Members as Family Gathering, August 7. So we're standing by for our guest, uh, Dr. Chikia Thomas, co-chair of the Global African Congress. We're looking forward to uh, the conference, International Conference on Reparations that's scheduled for Barbados. This is going to happen August 4 to 6. The concept paper discusses a planned International Congress of Members, familiarly called a family gathering. I'm, I'm reading straight from the, from the concept paper, by the way, the introduction. All right. Okay. The Global African Congress is an international network of Pan-Africanist and African-centered organizations. And uh, they are organizing the conference, the International Conference on Reparations. They are committed to building linkages and genuine permanent relationships across the African world. And I'm joined now on the phone lines by Dr. Chikia uh, Thomas, co-chair of the Global African Congress. Good morning, Dr. Chikia Thomas. Thank you so much. Uh, Good morning, uh, Sister Kabu. How are you doing? I am doing very well, if you two are well. Yes, I am. Thank you, thanks. I am. Ubuntu. Not too bad. (laughs) <laughs> great, great, great. Good to have you in the space this morning. Right. Um, so, so, first of all, let's talk about the Global African Congress before we, talk, we go into the conference that's due for Barbados, the Conference on Reparations. What is the Global African Congress? The Global African Congress is an organization of African people, both in the diaspora and on the continent. The Global African Congress came out of the World Conference Against Racism that was held in South Africa in 2001. Yes. Prior to the conference, a 
as you know, we were pushing the agenda of reparations. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was a miracle, uh, Kabu. Um, many African people in the diaspora and the continent who did not know each other prior to that, um, we came together. And the spirit of the people, the love, the, the commitment, the vision, the experience, that we have. So people in English speaking Caribbean who might not have known uh, the depth of the similarities of the experience in a country like Bolivia, for example, or Ecuador. I remember having that experience and it was, you know, it was like I was in Manchester Mm -hmm. talking to somebody. So Mm -hmm. it was just unbelievable. And we felt at the end of the conference it would be a sin unpardonable if we did not continue and get together. Mm -hmm. And so right there, at the end of the conference in South Africa, we agreed that we will have another conference. As you know, the last minute of the conference, countries like Britain and France and a number of those European countries get in to try to sabotage the agenda. And we have had to... And I was thinking, and sorry to interrupt, but I was thinking that as you talk, you know, because in, in my head I'm saying... You know, so much, so, so many positives came out of Durban, and yet there was this move on the part of some of the Western nations to 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 just sabotage and to disrupt um, that whole gathering in South Africa, the conference itself. Absolutely, we don't no question. In the person of Tony Blair himself, mm-hmm. who grew up in there. Um, Kabu, I remember working personally with the Nigerian ambassador. And so we had a series of meetings. You know, we had yes. a series of meetings in Geneva. We had one in Chile. And so as part of the NGO community, we would lobby the government representative and exchange language and strategy, language we want in the final declaration. Mm-hmm. I remember developing this powerful relationship with Nigerians because the Nigerians were, were just... Nigeria, Jamaica, Barbados mm-hmm. were just excellent yes. representatives of that. Yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm getting goose people just remembering how Barbados stood up. I, I think um, oh, um, yes. Ambassador Ambassador um, Kamisong was, was was also there, and I remember because I, co- right. I covered it. You know, I wasn't in South Africa because I was studying at the time, but I, I covered it, and I remember talking to um, Ambassador. Well, he wasn't an ambassador at the time, David Kamisong, and, um, and he was strident and angry. I think Barbara Blake Hanna from Jamaica was also there, and I remember having these conversations with her. You know, Colin Powell was supposed to... Um, I think Colin Powell came, didn't he? He did. He came and he walked out. And he walked when out, yes. Americans, yes, when the Americans... If the Americans are accustomed... The Americans, the Canadians, not all these countries are accustomed to getting what they want. And when they didn't, they walked out. In fact, it's not known, and I know David have not spoken a lot about it, but mm-hmm. David was physically assaulted in Chile by mm-hmm. one of the American diplomats. Mm-hmm. But my, there's an amazing event happened at the conference. I was in the NGO seat, mm-hmm. and um, so the government representatives sit in a different location at the conference than, than the NGO. Mm-hmm. And I heard this, some was like in the balcony, and I heard this Caribbean voice, this Caribbean voice. Mm-hmm. And I said, yes, you know, this is a Caribbean voice. I don't know who this person is. But I know the Cubans and the Barbadians. Mm-hmm. How the United Nations is organized, you sit up front by the alphabet. So A, B, C, you sit closely. Mm-hmm. So during the break, the NGO is not supposed to go into the section where the government representatives are. Mm-hmm. So I switched around my, my badge, mm-hmm. my ID, and I went down. I, I didn't know who David is. Mm-hmm. Never met him. Yes. And I went up and I introduced myself. I said, my brother, you're doing an exceptionally good job. Mm-hmm. And we have been friends ever since. Oh. Ever since. Oh. They, they, yes. they, I could honestly say there isn't a week when we have not communicated. Oh, with each other. Brilliant. He's going he's gonna to be here in Jamaica for our Garvey celebration. Just a segue to say that he's coming in. Yes, he's coming into Jamaica for, for a celebration of Moalimu, Marcus Messiah Garvey. That is on the 21st of, of, of August. So he's going to be here on the island. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And, and I'm heading to Barbados at his house on yes. the weekend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ah. <laughs> well, look how we segue gone far now. You see, it's one big family. And this, this is what, and exactly, and this is what the Global African Congress really represents, you know, the, I, I think, and just reading through it and looking at what you're doing, the African family. But, but, but organizationally now, um, tell us a little bit more about the structure and, and, and who, are, who are the persons involved and so on. 
Well, what we did to ensure that the the, the continuity and 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 the equity and the proper distribution, which the organization is structured in such a way that we have each region. So Africa has five regions, for example. So there's five regions. So each region has a representative, and it has to be balanced in terms of energy, male, female energy. So the so we have five. Um, region in Africa with two representatives from each region. Mm-hmm. The Caribbean has two representatives. North America has two representatives. South America, Asia has two representatives. So that's how it's structured. So the international structure is what we call the um, International Working Committee. So that's mm-hmm. the governing body. That's the highest decision making body of the organization. Yes. Um, of course, you know, resources when we were in Barbados, we didn't have representation from right across Africa. Mm-hmm. But what we do we, when we the other progressive organization we know that is in Africa, we ask them to recommend some other representative. And so we we appoint interim um, representative, for example, until we could meet at the International Congress of Members where people are adequately elected. Mm-hmm. And that's how the organization is governed. Yes, okay. The, 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 con- the Congress itself has been doing some great works um, over the years that you've, you've formed coming out of Durban. Um, can you talk us through some of what you've achieved so far and what you're working on? Thank you. Um, yes, uh, in a modest way, I think we have done, with the little resources we have, we have done quite well. For mm-hmm. example, um, we started lobby the Caribbean mm-hmm. government Mm-hmm. Say, for example, in 2000, immediately after it was formed in 2002, but we stepped up the campaign around the time of the, in preparation for the bicentenary of the abolition of the slave trade. Mm-hmm. And we had a very interesting experience when we have written to every Caribbean head of state, every one of them. I was quite surprised at the time that um, perhaps maybe two or three of the Caribbean government remember the bicentenary. But we had a very positive response, you know. Uh, P.J. Patterson, for example, was prime minister at the time um, in Jamaica. And I happened to know Professor Barry Shepard. We're very good friends. And so part of the strategy, what we use, for example, when we write a prime minister like uh, P.J. Patterson, we'd share the communication with someone like Barry and ask him, or other people who we know who know P- Prime Minister P.J. Patterson, to ensure that Jamaica gets involved. Mm-hmm. Um, of all the Caribbean Prime Ministers, I must give Prime Minister Ralph Gonzalez some credit. Mm-hmm. Because without any hesitation, not only did he invite us to come to St. Vincent and the Grenadine, but he also offered us some office space from which we could work. Yes, And again, without hesitation, he brought the resolution that we were asking for at the United Nations, demanding that the European and North American companies, families, those who benefit from the enslavement of African people to pay reparation. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the record of uh, the United Nations around the bicentenary, you see some exceptionally good debates. The solidarity from countries like Indian and a lot of Latin American countries demanding reparation. Mm-hmm. So that's one of our signature achievements. Yes. Um, by asking the Caribbean to form the Caribbean reparation. Very early days, we were, early days, we were lobbying them that the Caribbean need to form the reparation commission. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and, and no, that, uh, yes, go ahead. We did that with a great deal of solidarity. Mm-hmm. Going into South Africa, we thought the Americans were most advanced in the reparation agenda. And when we got together with a number of the American reparation activists, we said, look, you know, given the situation as, as it is, we recognize the Caribbean are perhaps the best example to win the reparation. So let's throw all of our energy behind the Caribbean and take it from there because success will follow success. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so the, the, the American brothers and sisters with whom we were working yeah. readily agree, and that's what we did. Yes. It, um, do you get the impression, and, and this is an aside again, another segue, but um, so, so here we are now. We have a, a, a CARICOM, uh, we have a Caribbean Reparations um, Committee, a CARICOM Reparations. We have a, the NCR here uh, on the island. But, but government involvement, and I hear many discussions, including those by Mike Henry from early in the days, that it has to be a government um, uh, uh, led initiative because um, some institutions only work government to government and so on. But but my my reading of this is that to a large extent, um, 
government is stalling and uh, and we see uh, it's almost like government is sabotaging itself with the reparations movement on the island in Jamaica and not and, and not least also the Caribbean your own thinking on that um no question that the Caribbean government has to be pushed absolutely no question um why did we go to government for example I wrote to when I discovered about the Carrington Plantation in Barbados and read the record mm-hmm. and recognized that the Church of England was involved in it. I mean, it was unbelievable to see the extent to which the church actually enslaved our people. So I once wrote the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and my sister, I I don't know if it was anger or it was just joking. I, you know, I sat mm-hmm. down and I said, this is what we want. Mm-hmm. The reparation. And I, 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 I had research, for example, what it costs to build. I'm in Toronto, so I research what it costs, the operational cost for the University of Toronto. Mm-hmm. I, I got that information. And I said, this is what we want. These are the faculties that we want. This is how many campuses we want for both the Africans and the continent and the diaspora. Mm-hmm. And the Archbishop wrote me back, the Archbishop of Canterbury wrote me back and says, with whom I negotiate. With mm-hmm. whom I negotiate. Mm-hmm. And yes, my Henry mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. being right. Mm-hmm. And we were in communication with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I recognize at that point yes. that those institutions are not going to negotiate with an and I take and, and I take the point, you know, I take the point seriously and I do understand it. But and then I hear you saying that well yes the um the Caribbean governments need to be pushed and, and maybe that is where the, 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 the work um on the ground and from the activists and so on need to come from in terms of pushing government to do what they need to do. The NCR, for example, here in Jamaica, I don't know if it is functioning. I you know, normally there's an announcement. That says um, every year, or or or, 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 or I think um, after an election or something. But but there's, there's usually an announcement to say these are the members of the NCR. Here's a cheer and so on and so forth. We have, I'm waiting for that announcement. I, I have not heard that announcement. I don't know if the NCR is functioning here on the island. I I don't know. I I heard that criticism right across the Caribbean. We heard that, for example, many of the people who become members of the NCR across the various Caribbean countries or, or and still are members of the GAC. And we would exchange ideas and program what to get in it. And the fact is, the government is not doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's a fact. And I suspect they're not doing it for a number of reasons. Some of them are not committed ideologically and philosophically to it. Mm-hmm. Some of them are feel afraid they don't want to offend uh, the European enslavers. You know, at the end of the day, my sister, mm-hmm. we as a people um, are still live in fear. One of the difficulties I've experienced in this struggle is where black people are afraid of offending white people. Yes, yes, yes. Psychologically, we are mm-hmm. preoccupied mm-hmm. by not getting white people upset. Mm-hmm. Even when they hurt us, Mm-hmm. in our jobs, mm-hmm. uh, in law enforcement, wherever mm-hmm. and whatever the experience are, to yes. even respond. Yes. And we respond to each other very differently than mm-hmm. how we respond to white people. We are afraid to offend white people. So that is yes. part of the socialization and psychology. Uh, yeah. Post-tra- post-traumatic, post-traumatic slavery disorder. Indeed. Yes. Indeed. Yes. So that's part of it. Mm-hmm. And I suspect that's very much alive and well Mm-hmm. Among the Caribbean leaders, we have to ask ourselves the question, as the Caribbean leaders themselves, any of them, have they committed epistemological insurrection? Mm. Have they committed mm-hmm. that when we get away culturally from the Eurocentric approach to life? Yes. Many of them, when they get into that room with the Europeans, suddenly they become afraid to talk. Yes, I once heard an African leader was criticizing other leaders that no matter how they plan, and as soon as they get into the room, 
all of those African leaders begin to talk as if water is in their mouth. In other words, you can't hear what they're saying. Yes. Mother Samad used to talk about it here on the island that watch the black man who starts digging his toes in the ground when he's talking to the white man and he refuses to look in his eyes. And, you know, and, and, and that sums it up even with our own governments. We either go with our, with our begging bowls or we're digging our toes in the ground. And it's, it's interesting because here we are in a, in a, at a time when our prime minister here in Jamaica has um, asked for, because I, I, I'm reliably informed in a lot of interviews that I've done here in the space, that you cannot become a member of the Queen's Privy Council unless you reach out and beg for it. And so he's a member of the Queen's Privy Council. That is within the last few months. So he must have begged for that. And then look at the fight. Backing a Boris Johnson who was, was, was an embattled um, prime minister anyway um, to, 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 be, to have a, a Jamaican representative at the head of a commonwealth, which wouldn't even really mean anything significant for Jamaica itself, considering what the role really is. And, and, and so when you see all of this happening, the, the, the tour recently of the Duke and, um, and, and his wife, the grandchildren, of the Queen of England within a time when we're talking about reparations and we're talking about getting rid of the monarchy and we're talking about, you know, t- a full independence and full freedom. All of this is happening on the sidelines um, here in Jamaica. My brother, I, 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 let, me, let, me, let me take a quick break and come back because we want to get to the conference and, and, and our conversation is going off <laughs> on, a tra- on a tangent. Let, let, me, let, me, let me do this and come right back and, and let's talk about the conference friends because it's all related i think at the end of the day um the international conference yes in barbados a quick break all right we're back with you inside of the africa forum it is running africa my very special guest is dr chikia thomas co-chair of the global african congress and the global african congress is organizing the international conference on reparations it's going to be from august 4 to 6 in Barbados, my very special guest, um, this is what we're talking about. This conversation is leading into the conference that's going to be happening in Barbados. Also, the International Congress of Members, that's a family gathering on August 7. Uh, Dr. Thomas, let's start now then with the, with the conference and the... Well, you, you gave us the, 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 the reasoning and the, uh, behind why the conference. Uh, this was a discussion that happened out of Durban and here you are now. Um, so, so tell us about the, the, the conference itself, what's going to happen and who will be there. Well, the conference itself is to reassess primarily where we are, you know, what we have accomplished. Um, we're drawing upon the experience, um, lessons learned, uh, what we need to improve and what we need to discard. At the same time, we are and just an international congress of members where we are renewing um, our elected officials, revising what uh, needs to be done, and so on and so forth. Um, we've invited the Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, obviously, of Barbados. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll be addressing the crowd as well as... Um, she, Barbados has a special envoy and reparation economic and franchise, and that's the Honorable Trevor Prescott, so he'll be there as well, mm-hmm. as well as CARICOM. And um, uh, Professor Hilary Beckles and a number of other people, and who, in fact, all of the Caribbean reparation, National Reparation Commission from the Caribbean was invited, mm-hmm. as well as reparation and social activist organizations from the continent, the United States, and COBRA, uh, all of them will be there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One of the um, deliverables that we are excited about, and I should say that this conference is co sponsored by. Cable Campus, UWI, and and, uh, and the JC. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the ex- things that we're exciting about, we in the process of negotiate, negotiation now, and I think I could talk about this because it's uh, quite a bit of accomplished, and I don't think I'm running the risk of um, announcing s- something before it's finalized. Mm-hmm. And that is, we are going to sign a memorandum of understanding between scholars outside of the Caribbean, mm-hmm. black and African scholars outside of the Caribbean, with UWI specifically to share experience, research, as well as resources mm-hmm. to help the CARICOM Reparation Commission. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we have a number of Jamaicans that are living abroad yes. of multiple skills that is not being utilized to advance the reparation agenda. So we... That void, we're finding a way by which we could fill it. 
Mm-hmm. We have a number of scientists, for example, working in the metropolitan centers. Yes. Uh, and when we look at the ravage of the pandemic, why mm-hmm. our society, why the level of disparity between us and the developing world? At the mm-hmm. same time, we have a number of skilled people from these different parts of the world, and they're not being utilized effectively as they could. Mm-hmm. So we want mm-hmm. to address that void. Yes. And so we are looking for a memorandum of understanding between academic and professionals. Okay. That will feed right into the reparation movement. Mm-hmm. Okay, that and, makes a lot of sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, it, 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 and so this, this once this is signed, what, what are we expecting to see happen? Well, I could tell you that, that Dalhousie University is extremely excited and the Metropolitan mm-hmm. Toronto University of Toronto is, is extremely excited, for example, and so is Waterloo. Yes. Um, we're looking at how can we extend resources, how can we share research, um, somebody, there's a professor at the University of Toronto who has been doing some work on the decolonization of the educational system, mm-hmm. looking at the colonial structure of the education system. Yes. And that is applied, this applicable, the research is applicable to any one of our society. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that could feed right into the classroom in Jamaica. Yes. Oh, and, brilliant, you know, brilliant. It could yes. feed right mm-hmm. into begin to question, for example, our living condition in the community. Yes. Why is it uh, for example, when somebody got killed in Jamaica, it, it becomes the norm. Why did violence become the norm? Mm-hmm. People are not concerned about the loss of life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we think that's all tied into the legacy of enslavement. And so yes. we need to deconstruct that. Mm-hmm. And when we speak of black life, we want to speak of the value of black life, that is the evaluation of black life, as mm-hmm. we have seen that over the last number of years. Yes. So those are some of the things that we think we could feed back and we want to enhance our right. capabilities to address those things in a more profound way. Brilliant, brilliant. And who are some of the speakers um, scheduled for the conference August 4 to 6 at Kville? Well, uh, we have uh, Professor Beckles. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we have representative from uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, F. 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 Toby from um, Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Professor Williams from the United States, Dr. Isaac uh, Saley from Toronto, um, uh, um, a businessman who is a consultant, well, has a consulting company, uh, Keith Jeffers, who is a specialist, for example, in anti-racism, mm-hmm. anti-black racism. He looks at, he's a specialist in our national structure. Mm-hmm. So we're going to look at how racism is structured in organization. So these people are making presentation, but more important, Sister Kabu, what we are doing, we're following the Walter Rodney model. Mm-hmm. We are setting up what we call a grounding session. Oh. So we invite people like yourself to come in as a group session and look at different aspects of what we are doing and where we are. Mm-hmm. We're, mm-hmm. Having, um, we're having another section that look at the legal option. Yes. We feel, for example, that yes, CARICOM is dragging its feet on the question of legal. Mm-hmm. The, the legal option. Mm-hmm. So the GHC has a series of lawyers that represent it from African people from all over the world. Last night we had a meeting. We was quite pleased to um, hear some of the lawyers from Colombia, for example, and the excitement with the new development there mm-hmm. coming and what they're planning to do. So we will be exploring ideas of the legal option. Yes. yes. Um, we might not necessarily go after government first, but we we'll go after some institution, the low iron fruit yes. that could bring us some. Mm-hmm. some results. Mm-hmm. So those are strategies that we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at food security, climate justice, of healthcare. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a wide range of professionals. Uh, I love, I love that. Yes, I love that food security uh, is included in, in that. I love that you included food security in that. I yes, think it's, it's, a, it's yes, a major it's concern. A yes. On our doorstep. Yes. You know, it's one that did hurt into tension. Urgent attention, and I'm not. I'm not quite sure that our, our governments understand. Um, but but this, the writing was on the wall, right? Uh, but but there was there was a confusion between food security and food safety. I can tell you that I've interviewed all of the ministers of agriculture in this space, and 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 that was the, the confusion many years ago. Until here we are. Yes. Now, until here we are. 
where we're still on the island here in Jamaica. We're not prepared. We're not ready. And we're still dancing, you know, like, you know, playing Russian roulette, it, it appears. So, so I'm glad that it, that it is included. I note, in that, I note also that the Africa Union did make it the, the theme um, this year, celebrating Africa Day, food, food security, global food security um, for, for, for the continent of Africa and the diaspora. So, um, let, let's see, so, so what do you hope to come out of a conference at the end of the day? What we hope to come out is that people will uh, leave the conference uh, more enhanced body of knowledge of what reparation is and what we can do for ourselves. Mm-hmm. as well as to uh, how we're going to enhance the strategy to pursue reparative justice uh, from the European and North America. Mm-hmm. Quite frankly, uh, as I said, we think that the government is dragging their feet. Yes. And so we need to build a movement. In a very recent sense, through the history of the Caribbean, mm-hmm. the people are always the head of the government. You know? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it is true. From the days of Chief Tachi. <laughs> it is true. It is true. <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. we're hoping to do, we're hoping to galvanize, to organize better and continue to yeah. put some pressure and act independently where we have to. Yes. Act in solidarity and in cooperation, full cooperation with the government, all government. Irrespective of political party. And I want this particular message Mm-hmm. But Jamaica, because I know Jamaicans are particularly have certain rigidity about political party. Reparation mm-hmm. is above political party. Of course, all of us was in the in enslavement. All yes. of us have our genesis in enslavement, mm-hmm. and it's so much bigger than political party. Yeah. And in fact, when we understand what reparation is, we, we recognize some of the fallenness and the structural weaknesses about the political party, where neighbors are fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, each other. We recognize mm-hmm. how nonsensical that it is. Mm-hmm. So and, and so we're hoping that this kind of reasoning could come out of this conference and we yes. begin to implement it ourselves mm-hmm. while at the same time continue to put pressure on our enslavers right. to take up their responsibility. And, of course. And, and once again, just to let our family know, let our listeners know that the International Conference on Reparations um, being organized by the Global African Congress is happening in Barbados, August 4 to 6. For persons who want to attend, how do they do that? Well, they can. Um, we, we circulate the flyers. We encourage them to register and um, so for adequate planning. Yes, mm-hmm. we are getting out of the COVID-19 pandemic, but mm-hmm. you know we have to take that into consideration. So they mm-hmm. can, in fact, uh, register our contact in Jamaica is Trevor Brown. He could make the information available, flyers, information yes. to circulate. They could register online mm-hmm. directly. Um, the rooms available at the Univ- at Cable Campus, as well as information about for those people who do not wish to stay on campus. Yes. Information available that they can register them for the conference. So we invite as many people as possible to attend the conference and to become part of the reasoning session. Right. Preparation is about the people. Of course. And so we want to get as many people as possible. It's to our, our business. Uh, it's our business. Involved. Thank you so much, Dr. Chikia Thomas. We look forward to the Repar- International Reparations Conference um, in Barbados and um, hopefully to, 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 to cover that and to report back. But one thing we know is that we're going to have an eye on this. Thank you so much, my brother. In this segment of the program, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. David Mohammed, Eastern Caribbean representative of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam. He's the author of Black Studies, Knowledge is Power and Black Youth at Risk, from Juvenile Delinquency to Criminal Gang Activity. He's the head of the Education Department at the University of the West Indies uh, School of Business in Trinidad. He holds a PhD in sociology and a double major bachelor degree in sociology and education from UE. He also holds a teacher's diploma from the Valsayan College, now University of Trinidad and Tobago, and has over 25 years' experience in the profession. Dr. David Mohammed is also the founder and director of the Black Agenda Project Organization and the Kwame Ture Education Center. He's frequently invited guest speaker across the Caribbean, as well as in the U.S. and the U.K. Dr. David Mohammed is joining me on the phone lines. In June 2022, 
Dr. Mohammed and colleagues launched the George Padmore Boys Academy teaching and training young men 17 years and under in discipline, self-awareness, conflict resolution and life skills. He's traveled to 36 countries and counting and is also a TV and radio presenter, a writer, a prisons program coordinator, an accomplished musician and a second degree black belt in karate. Dr. David Mohammed. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Sister Kabu, and good morning and greetings to all of your listeners. Greetings, my brother. I keep forgetting that you're a karate expert, you know. Every once in a while, it jumps out of me from your bio. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I haven't had to use it in a while. <laughs> but I would love to see. Yes. You know, I was saying to our listeners this morning that um, you're there in Trinidad. You're Trinidadian, African, we all are. But here we are, the country where we get our ancestors got dropped off on the ship. This is how we, we identify uh, yeah. nationally. And, that, and, and I've said that, you know, I've said to you that I, I haven't had the cascaduro, but that you've promised that um, you'll ensure that, that it happens. Because in the words of Samuel Selvon, uh, in Tr- there's a saying in Trinidad that whoever eats a cascaduro must return to Trinidad. So maybe this is why I'm here, not able to get a flight out to St. Lucia, because I have to go to Trinidad and it looks like it's just not working. <laughs> I've not had the cascaduro. So... Right. What is it? Tell our listeners what the cascadura is, David. Uh, it's, it's a fish, and <laughs> uh, to be honest, it's, um, the appreciation of it is more heritage-based than historic, more so than contemporary. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's, it's somewhat of a, a myth, I'd say. <laughs> you know, I haven't had it in probably several years. You're you're disappointing us because we read Samuel Selvon here in the Caribbean, you know, uh, in Jamaica, and the cascadura is right there, you know. It starts one of the stories, Ways of Sunlight. (laughs) All right. Well, I can tell you one one food that would probably be consuming a lot more these days. Yes. Would be all all the alternatives to flour because that Uh. is where the price of bread has significantly increased, the price Mm -hmm. of flour has significantly increased. Mm-hmm. And so we Same are here. encouraging our people to explore all of the alternatives to white flour, mm-hmm. such as the breadfruit, the cassava, the yes. dashing, the yams, the edos, the green mm-hmm. folks, the plantains, and so on. Mm-hmm. And, and you make a good point because it's the very same, obviously we're having the same issues here where the price of flour has skyrocketed on which people can buy flour now and buy bread and, and so on. So, um, yeah. you know, it's a, luxury, it's a luxury item. It's a luxury item. So cassava is, you know, there was a minister of agriculture here who, um, who was the minister? Was it Tufton? Who was encouraging Jamaicans to plant cassava and, and, and the nation laughed at him, you know. So, so eat cassava um, or cassava flour or anything like that, um, but I eat bami. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that, that made from it, yeah. yes, it's made from cassava, but 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 the point, as well. yes, but, but so dasheen can make the flour and um, cassava can do that, breadfruit also can do that, and we have breadfruit stone in dogs, literally. Um, so, so thank yeah, you for that. Mm-hmm. Bread, bread food, in mm-hmm. itself, bread food is the only starch that there is in existence that lowers blood sugar for diabetics, mm. which is almost like a miracle. I didn't know that. You know, and, and we, we have all of, yeah, we have mm-hmm. all of these things growing in abundance. Yes. Now remember, our, our whole diet is still quite post-colonial and Eurocentric with the over excessive use of potatoes. Yes, um, Irish potatoes. Our taste for food yeah. are also imperial based. Right, and, and, and interestingly enough, the Irish potatoes is one of the most is most one of the most dangerous um, foods that we can eat as a people. Irish potato, but yet it is you, you don't hear that. Sweet potato is, is pretty good, but Irish is just as damaging um, to you health wise um, as as anything yeah, that's not good for that. It's how we prepare it as well. Because yes, we over grease the pot. 
fry it. Mm-hmm. You know, and yes. it, it, this French fry culture yes. that we have as well. Yes. Yes. You know, incidentally, French fries don't come from France, they come from Belgium, but that's another story. That's another story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. And, and another case of cultural appropriation. Yes, yes. You know, oh boy, we're looking, we, we, we miss you on this side of the world, man. We're looking forward to, to having you, um, here in Jamaica, because you're coming in for the uh, tribute to Moalamu Marcus Messiah Garvey. You're going to be one of the guest speakers um, this year. You're always a guest speaker when you come in, and um, you're going to be a guest speaker this year again. Um, talk a little, a little bit about. Uh, l- l- let me tell me your experiences over the years coming to the to the. Um, the tribute to Moalamu Marcus Mazaya Gava because I remember the first year that it was Stephen Golding who called me, I think, to ask um, if I knew you and, and, to, and to, to say, I sh- you know, let us le- please invite David Mohammed um, to speak on. I think, uh, wait, did you come into the island for a UNIA event at that time? Was that what it was? Um. I did attend the UNIA event in that, actually, that would have been 2015 right. when I launched my book, Black Studies. In yes, Houston. yes. I was at the and launch, by the way. It, it rained, but it was well yes, attended. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. It was a lot of rain. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so that would have been November. Yes. yes. And okay. that was a very, very, very special time for me mm-hmm. as well because mm-hmm. that was November 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember it was the 30th of November. I got yeah. back to Trinidad on the 1st of December. Mm-hmm. And then I was in Chicago on the 2nd of December with Minister Farrakhan. Yes. I was in yes. for one full day right. on the 2nd. Then I came back to Trinidad on the 3rd. Mm-hmm. Then I was in London on the 5th. I did three launches in, in London, England, and Slough, and in Birmingham. Mm. So, you know, and then I think um, in January I went to Antigua and St. Vincent and Grenada and so on. Yes. And then um, it would have been the next August that I would have been invited to the Marcus Garvey celebrations for the first time, 2016. Yes. And, and you then, um, I, I, of course, I, I've been back every year since. Yes, yeah, every year since since that, and and thank you for that coming yeah, in. Except the two years of the pandemic, right? Yes, true. But but here we are now, um, back in the courtyard, and um, and and you'll be you'll be speaking. So your experiences of the years of coming in. Talk to me about you know how your your own thinking, looking back, reflecting on the different tributes that you have been to over the years here. Well, well, well you know. Um Every single case is so memorable for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just meeting so many different people and meeting so many beautiful people. Mm-hmm. I think the first year when I was there, 2016, Dr. Umar Johnson was there. Ah, yes. And then the next year, um, Malik Shabazz. Shabazz yes, yes. Um, the third year, 2018, I think Dr. Julius Garvey mm-hmm. would have done the feature address. And then in 2019, I did the feature address. Yes. And then, of course, 2020, 2020 and 21 with the pandemic, but I was involved in the online event. Mm-hmm. But being there yes. is so electric because just coming in the courtyard, and, you know, it, it normally takes. Uh, maybe between 10 or 15 minutes just to drive through the crowd sure. uh, from the outside to get in and then once mm-hmm. you're in again so many mm-hmm. beautiful people yeah. um, it's always so many people uh, but, but and what's interesting is I often see former colleagues from England and America mm. in that courtyard <laughs> right, so, it's, a, um, huge, it's a family affair <laughs> It is, it is, it is so. Really, really missed to make it so much 
in yes. those last two years. We're looking forward to seeing you and listening to you again this year. And 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 obviously, well, Shamara Preston is a lead producer this year, as you know very well. Um, what 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 is your what what is your um? I know, I know that the, the, you're speaking generally on the theme. Um, tell us a little bit about um how you will be approaching uh the the theme itself. Right. Well, I want to get the point across about the issue of our Republican status as Caribbean nations. Mm -hmm. And by the fact that, of course, Jamaica has been flirting with the idea for quite a while. Currently, there are only four countries in the English-speaking Caribbean that have taken this step. Um, Diana was first in 1970. Now, this is not and again, I mean, just to have this conversation, we have to make a distinction between independence and republicanism. Yes. Many of us as Commonwealth nations, even after we became independent, we still had the Queen of England as the head of state. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. had a governor who was the representative of that office. Mm -hmm. So becoming a republic is abandoning all ties and relationships politically with the royal monarch of the United Kingdom and having our own, well, what is normally done is we replace the governor with a president. Mm -hmm. So Guyana became independent in 1966, but we became a republic just four years later in 1970. Trinidad and Tobago became independent just three weeks after Jamaica in 1962, but we became a republic in 1976. And then Dominica... Um, which is the most unique case of all, Dominica became independent and a republic at the same time, mm -hmm. which is in 1978. Mm -hmm. So they're the only case like that. Yes. But yes. think about this, though. We have 15 members of CARICOM, and the three, the first three that became independent, look, look at the time period, 1970, 1976, and 1978. Mm -hmm. And then it took 40 plus years for the next country to become a republic, which was Barbados just last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so on November 30th, for their Independence Day, um, almost four decades later, they yes. became a republic in 2020. Hold, hold that thought there. It's kind of odd. Yes, hold that thought for me because oh. I want I wanted to, to explore yeah. that. Um, how odd is that? L let me take on my very special guest is Dr. David Muhammad. He's coming in for the tribute, IRFM's annual tribute to Mualimu Marcus Messiah Garvey. And uh, we'll be speaking on the theme, um, which is um, removing the queen, removing the monarchy, removing... Uh, England, Britain as head of state, um, the monarch. So, so um, you're saying that over the years, um, looking back at at countries, um, David, that removed the, the the British monarchy as head of state, that they, the, the the first the three there were three um, rapid in the seventies, and then not until. Yeah how many years after, 40 years after or so, um, then Barbados. And you're saying that's pretty odd. Talk to us about that. Yes, yeah, so clearly it would have been on the minds of us as Caribbean peoples in the 1970s. And then it would have been just abandoned for throughout the entire 1980s, 1990s. Um, former Jamaica Prime Minister P.J. Patterson was raising that discussion in fact after he left office he, he lamented over the fact that Jamaica was not yet a republic so it is also in the minds of the general population that there seems to be some kind of benefit in holding on to that relationship now that to me is an illusion so for example in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2005 they held a referendum to decide. Now again, Barbados did not have a referendum. They just took it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing with freedom. Mm -hmm. We have Emancipation Day coming up. Yes. But every Emancipation Day, we celebrate Liberation Day. Mm -hmm. Because Emancipation is something that is given to you. Mm -hmm. 
liberation is something that you take. Take, yes. Emancipation is when your enemies, former enslavers and colonizers, have a meeting. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in their meeting, they decide to free you. Mm-hmm. But liberation, on the other hand, is when we have a meeting. Yes. And we decide to free ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, in St. Vincent, they took it to the people and said, well, look, what, what, what do we want? Do we want to become a republic? Do we want to break away from the monarchy? So, they are interpreting that question from the point of view of a post-colonial imperial perspective where we are laboring under this illusion that the white man's ice is colder, the white man's sugar is sweeter, and his technology is more advanced. Mm-hmm. So the people turned it down. Just like in Bermuda. In Bermuda, they had a referendum for independence. Bermuda is still not an independent nation. So in their mind, it was better for them to mm-hmm. remain an overseas territory of sort. I mean, there, there are varying statuses with that. But they felt it was better for them to stay. Mm-hmm. Now, what we have to ask ourselves is, do you want to be a slave? Everyone, everyone will say no to that, right? Everyone mm-hmm. will say no to that. But the extension of that question is, would you rather be a slave eating three meals a day or a free man eating one meal a day? Mm-hmm. Now, that is where people will stop and think, hmm, <laughs> yes. what's more important here? My mm-hmm. personal integrity, freedom, and liberation or a full stomach? Mm-hmm. Now, to have less technology, less money, less opportunity, less infrastructure development, it gives me now a job and a task to engage in mass development of my region mm-hmm. and also to force me to work closer together in regional integration with my neighbors. Mm-hmm. So what is important... So that's people are thinking right now. Jamaica is thinking about a referendum also. Whether or not that happens is still to be seen. Um, the, the government of Jamaica is talking out, out of both sides of its mouth. It's like a pania machete. And I know that that, that extended metaphor <laughs> is, a, is a mixed metaphor, but here we go. Um, so, so this is what Jamaica is doing. But, but it's, it's a situ- so, so how it is being... You, what you've done is, is kind of laid it out um, excellently in terms of how Jamaicans have been made to look at this thing. And it tells me that the public education is critical that there is, and I hear the Advocates Network with um, Professor Rosalie Hamilton underscoring the need for before you talk about anything is to go through that public education process. That's what Nelson Mandela said in South Africa before the first election in 1993. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, everyone's talking about um, all African people having the right to vote. Of course, that is excellent. But more important than that is voter education Mm -hmm. to give an idea of what is at stake. Now, the most famous referendum ever to take place in all of Caribbean history is, of course, the referendum that took place in Jamaica in 1961. Mm -hmm. And I respectfully say, to me, that goes down as a big mistake Mm -hmm. where you had the Federation of the West Indies, the ten nations that were formed. Now, it's true we were a colony at the time, okay? Mm -hmm. But we could have the ten of us together could have become independent mm-hmm. together. Let our listeners know what I you're mean, talking about, because I, 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 we, we know what, <laughs> those of us who, who study history, right. and because a lot of people, are lo- the history is not compulsory in Jamaica, you know. So, the, the, you, you talk yeah, about this 61 referendum, there's a lot, a lot of, history. yes, so, 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 let, so talk to us about that 61 referendum that right. year, that, yeah. So, so, so just, just before the Federation of West Indies, there have been a number of combinations of Caribbean territories becoming one political sovereignty, long before the Federation. Mm-hmm. So you have, for example, there's a union of Tobago, St. Vincent and Grenada. Um, we had, at one time, in the Federation, Federation, Montserrat was part of St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, up to 1972, Cayman Islands was part of the territory of Jamaica. Mm-hmm. So you had all these configurations over the years. Now, in 1958, we officially established a 
Federation of the West Indies. There are 10 nations in the Caribbean very, very quickly. It would have been trying to make about it is Jamaica, St. Vincent St. Lucia, St. Kitts, Dominica, mm-hmm. Antigua, um, Barbados, I think I said Barbados already, Anguilla, and Montserrat. Mm-hmm. So we had 10 countries. And these 10 countries were like one country. Just like how you have the Bahamas, which is close to 3,000 different pieces of land. Just like how you have um, Grenada, Caracou, and Petit Martinique. Different pieces of land that are forming one country. That's how the whole Caribbean was. But mm-hmm. the only thing about it was that we were still a colony. And then Jamaica became independent, August 6, 1962. Trinidad and Tobago became independent a few weeks later. Mm -hmm. But just before that, Jamaica held a referendum to decide on whether or not they should stay in the Federation. Mm -hmm. And it was a very slim decision. So the people of Jamaica voted, I think it was 52% said, no, we want to leave. 48% said, we want to stay. Now, if we go back to that particular history, what the people in Jamaica were responding to in 1961 for that referendum was not so much whether we wanted to be one family with our Caribbean brothers and sisters. They were responding to the propaganda that was coming out of the United States on the Manley family, Norman Manley, and by extension Michael Manley, the whole issue of communism. So the people in Jamaica, because remember, Norman Manley was the premier. But Norman Manley was not the first prime minister. That should tell you something. That's Mm -hmm. different to everywhere else in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else in the Caribbean, whoever was the premier became the first prime minister. Mm -hmm. E.T. Joshua in St. Vincent, Mm -hmm. Eric Williams in Trinidad and Tobago, Grandly Errol Barrow, Mm -hmm. E.T. Joshua, um, throughout, mm-hmm. throughout the Caribbean, mm-hmm. D.C. Bird in Antigua, etc. Yes. John Compton in Tunisia. So, mm-hmm. in Jamaica now, something strange happened where the man who became the first premier of the country prior to independence mm-hmm. did not become the first prime minister. Oh, our brother Jerry, then, our brother Jerry Small has um, done a lot of work in this in this field in this department, and has spoken uh, on this many many times on his program, and in and, and I think in, in in other public and other pro- public platforms, and in this space also talking about that dynamic between Bustamante and Norman Manley. Um, it's it's a whole other but, 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 kettle but, 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 of tea that on communism. Yeah. Because remember, the Manleys were accused of being communists. But, 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 but that was much later with Michael Manley. Wasn't that much later with Michael Manley himself and not necessarily with... with right, yeah. so, yes. So, so mm-hmm. Michael Manley was accused full right. out, yes. full out of pure communism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that was sensationalism coming from the United States because at that time, communism was like like how so-called fundamentalist Islamic terrorism was considered around the time of 9-11. So even people like Malcolm X and Paul Robeson and Claudia Jones and so many thinkers at that time, once you were African conscious and encouraging the people in any kind of revolutionary direction, they branded you as communists. In even, the even, 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 and, 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 and yeah, so we saw what happened also with the poets like Claude McKay and them out of the, um, the Harlem Renaissance and, and, and how they of themselves course, also. Well, so, all right, so, so, so let us, uh, so but, 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 but my, my, my point is, though, mm-hmm. my point is, though, yes. I just the cabal, yes. is that when this referendum was held in Jamaica in 1961, the people were not so much responding to the issue of Caribbean unity as they were responding to the entanglement of local political issues at that time. Same thing happened in St. Vincent. When the people turned down the referendum to become a republic, it wasn't so much the republicanism that they were thinking of, Mm -hmm. but it was issues, local issues with our Prime Minister Raul Gonzalez and his opposition and things he was being accused of and so on. Mm-hmm. So I think it is a bad idea, me personally, it's a bad idea to have a referendum for something like this, which is supposed to be 
natural. And especially, you don't have I to agree with you. Them on a slave plantation to yes. ask the slaves if they want to be free. Mm-hmm. That's not something you ask. You yes. have to take it how it's Kevin style who forced them into their freedom. Yes. Whether they wanted it or not. Like, hold a line. And I believe that's the approach we have to take. Hold a line for me, please, uh, David. Let me take a quick break. At the Jamaica Customs Agency, we care for our employees, customers, stakeholders, citizens, and our country. Customs cares. The temperature by the Jamaica Customs Agency is... 30 degrees Celsius here in Otorias, and I understand it's raining in some parts of Jamaica. So for those persons in St. Mary who are having rains right now, be safe, take care of yourselves. I'm not quite sure where else, but you're writing to me. I know it's raining in parts of St. Mary. Where else? Is it raining in Kingston? Only Optical Elements has the latest technology lenses and frames to suit your taste and budget. Visit us at 67 Halfway Tree Road, online at OpticalElementsJA.com or call 929-8284. Optical Elements, vision in style. The time by Optical Elements is... Four minutes now after 8 o'clock, you're inside of the Africa Forum. It is Running African and Dr. David Muhammad is my special guest online. We're talking about uh, his... Upcoming visit. He is um, going to be the guest, one of the guest speakers here at our annual tribute to Marlon Marcus Messiah Garvey on August 21. Uh, also speaking will be our own um, Bert Samuels, Pan African attorney at law, and the Barbados' uh, uh, ambassador to CARICOM, David Commission. So they'll all be here on the ground in the courtyard of IRFM. All right, so, 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 so David, um, so the idea then yes. of a referendum uh, to remove the Queen of Head of State, yes. you're saying that that is a bad idea. This is where Jamaica is going, and you're saying in, from your looking at this, this is one of the worst ideas. But um, the, the uh, Minister of Constitutional and Legal Affairs, um, she's made the announcement on the ground here, Marlene Malahu Fort, and um, the, one of the things that she said is that they're looking at this now, and then she's, uh, she, along with the government, they have said over and over again that there's going to be a referendum. So this is where we're going. Um, what do you think then? Um, I, I hope mm-hmm. there's a national debate mm-hmm. prior to the referendum to decide on what, in fact, there should be a referendum on the referendum. Mm-hmm. Because we have to confront the logic of it. Having a referendum for something like that is like having a referendum with, a, oh, man, this is with me, Sean. Having a referendum to decide if we're going to become a republic is like babies in a hospital having a referendum as to whether or not their umbilical cords should be cut. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Having a referendum to become a republic is like 18 year olds across the nation having a referendum to decide on whether or not they're ever going to leave their parents' house. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Having a referendum like that is like prisoners in jail having a referendum to decide that when their term of imprisonment is up, whether they're going to leave the prison or whether they're going to stay in the prison. Mm-hmm. All of those examples are clear, evident. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no second thought, period. So why are we having second thoughts about our freedom, independence, our liberation, and our autonomy? Mm-hmm. That should be a natural, progressive process of what it means to be a sovereign state in the first place. And by the fact that I'm going to the people, to ask them to vote and decide on whether they want their full freedom or whether they want partial freedom in itself could be interpreted as disrespectful to the people. Mm -hmm. Because it's like I'm telling you, I don't really see you as a fully liberated citizen with the right to determine his own destiny. I don't really see you like that. As a matter of fact, I think you might want to remain pitched to the plow or chained to the axle. So let me ask you, do you want your full freedom? Mm-hmm. Th- that's a question. If, if someone asks me if I want to remain a slave or not, I'll be yeah. insulted by it. Yes. So we have to look at, uh, much more broadly at what this represents mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and also to how our children would interpret that. Yes. Because the message that's being sent to the upcoming educated generation of young people is that somehow our relationship with the British monarch 
is better than our own internal sovereignty. That means something has to be wrong with our sovereignty. And that is, and that is why it goes so I back. I want it. And you see, and, and that takes us right back um, to the education system and, 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 and then also to the conversations on public education because we've got, we, we have a colonial education system, uh, a, a, a colonial, I would say neo, ongoing colonial um, education system. And so that what, the thinking is that what is British is better than what is Jamaican. What is African is of a lower class than what is British. And so we, so, so, so we find ourselves even more than Barbados in these days as being um, little, little British people running up and down on the island. This is why the, the, I, I think the government, which is a pania machete, um, wants to do this referendum because they know that this referendum, because of the education, the miseducation of the masses of the people that this referendum is likely to fail. Without public education, this referendum is likely to fail. And you can just go down the road and do a vox pop any minute. You're in the media uh, also, David. Just go down the road and do a vox pop any minute. And you'll hear how many people tell you, we're better off if we go back to Britain. We're better off if we never get independence. <laughs> this is a thinking. This is a thinking of, of, of a lot of Jamaicans. So, 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 so the question we have to ask ourselves is whether or not um, there needs to be more activism on the ground, grassroots-wise, um, to push the, the, the government away from this idea of referendum. Mayor Motley herself um, was criticized for not calling a referendum on, 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 in, in Barbados. Why was she able to do this? Why was she able to do this? Mm -hmm. Right now, because she clearly um, is outstanding at this moment, above and beyond probably all of the other Caribbean heads of governments right now, because she has been progressive in not just this issue, but in also many other issues. Take, for example, when we had the first ever, and this is a day that we have to commemorate, September the 7th. The last year, September the 7th, was the first ever Africa CARICOM Heads of Government Summit. First time in history, after 400 plus years of us being taken out of there for the first time ever, last year, we had this summit. It was online. But it's a day that we have to commemorate because September the 7th is now Africa CARICOM Day. So we heard all these heads of government from Africa and all these heads of government from the Caribbean giving their contributions. And I was embarrassed to hear as a priority so many of them talking about vaccines. Yes. We're get more vaccines. Yes. Share the I, uh, I, I was there too. I, I logged in. Motley. Yes. You're correct. Go ahead. Mia Motley, mm -hmm. she, she's talking about, well, we have to get a direct flight mm -hmm. from the Caribbean straight to Africa. Yes. We have to have dual citizenship for people of African descent in mm -hmm. the Caribbean with an African nation. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way to do direct trade between Africa and the Caribbean. That's what she's saying, but as other leaders talk about vaccines. Yes, yes. But, but, you know, but, but this is why as you mentioned, the education. This is why point number 10 of the 10-point plan of action for reparations by CARICOM mm -hmm. is the transfer of technology. Mm -hmm. And that is probably the biggest impediment for us and why so many of our citizens will feel that there's still uh, benefits in keeping these ties. Mm -hmm. And let me use very quickly as an example, chocolate, right? Cocoa grows in the Caribbean. It mm -hmm. does not grow in England. Mm -hmm. So let's say Grenada. The Caribbean Grenada and Africa. Has some of the best cocoa in the world. Yeah. Right? So Grenada will grow its cocoa. They'll keep some for themselves and they'll send some overseas to England. Mm -hmm. With the cocoa that we keep for ourselves, we make some chocolate and we put it on the supermarket shelf. With the cocoa that we sent to England, they make some chocolate as well. Mm -hmm. 
that they export some of it back to us, and it goes on the supermarket shelf right next to the chocolate that we made and put there. Mm-hmm. And probably cheaper. Now, here we, here we, the customer comes. Mm-hmm. And we look at the chocolate that we made, and then we look at the chocolate that we shipped overseas, processed it, manufactured it, put a label on it, call it Cadbury's or Hershey's or Snickers or Mars or, mm-hmm. or Milky or whatever, send it back over to us. And then we look at the foreign one and the local one and we take the local one. Mm-hmm. Now, sorry, we, we take the it's foreign, a foreign one. one. Yes. Uh, now, that choice, that choice, according to philosopher Lloyd Bess, that choice is based on imperialism because it's not an economic choice. He's not just looking at the price, but he's looking at the fact that he was socialized in a way to believe that whatever is from overseas yeah. is superior, and whatever is locally Con- made or manufactured is inferior. Consuming and our education has cons- made us consuming that identity, way. consuming <laughs> identity, um, because this and this is why yeah. you know the fast food chains do so well because we think that if we take our children there for birthday parties, oh, if we go there God. for Sunday evening dinners and so on, that we're consuming identity. That by consuming what's coming to us, we then become what they have been selling to us through advertising. I'm a marketer. I'm telling you that that's right. how, this is how it work. But 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 here's the thing: as you talk about chocolate here on the island uh, in Jamaica. We had Highgate Foods, right? This is where they used to make Cadbury. Highgate Foods. It's right. It's near. Oh, I, haven't, I haven't heard of Highgate in years. High, Highgate, but no, so because good. Highgate, because the factory, the factory has been closed. Well, and reopened. The factory is now a. The, uh, where, where, the high, where, where, where we made Highgate Foods chocolate, the factory. That's where we're now making caskets. Yeah. Caskets are now being made in that place. And that, oh. that, that's a metaphor that we're going to have to one day sit down and talk about and understand. That the, the, the place where we made, manufactured, made um, chocolate, because we, we grow cho- um, cocoa in Jamaica, and made chocolate there that now we're making caskets there, right? The place where, the place where we made, yes, the place where we made banana chips is now a church, we have to have a conversation about what's happening to our nation. Yeah. Um, please hold for me, David. I, when we come back in a, in a, for our final segment, we'll, we'll talk some more on the, uh, the issues um, that you'll be looking at when you come in.